and try to stop her. They send an army out to stop her before she can cross into Persia. And that turns out to be a big mistake, not so much for Kinane, but for their continued control. She is murdered by, or at least killed, by the um, leader of the forces that are sent to stop her before she's even able to finish her, her opening speech and the kinds of speeches that show up in antique sources. And basically the troops rise up in revolt at the sight of Alexander's sister, Philip's daughter, a woman who they already know as a commander, being killed in this way. And they actually forced the marriage that the generals had tried to stop. So Kinani doesn't win in the long run, but she's in there. She's an important player in the game. Do you think she hasn't been given a fair shake in history by sources for various reasons, or, or what do you think? Well, I mean, in the source that she's in, which is a book called Stratagems, that is basically about the end of Alexander's empire, she's given a fair shake in that. I mean, she doesn't get a lot of airtime, as it were, Mm -hmm. but nobody's saying she didn't fight, she was a slut, she didn't exist. None of that is in there. It's just It's a small story in the bigger story of Alexander's empire. And by and large, we look at Alexander. And then we don't look as clearly at all the different pieces that that empire crumbles into. She gets lost from the bigger picture just because we tend to learn the big stories, not the little stories. Right. Before jumping forward in time uh, up to around the Middle Ages or so, something you mentioned earlier was that There's a difference, you said, between uh, warriors and soldiers, where there are fewer examples of women as part of the regular army and conscripted into specific forces. But I'm curious about that. What are some examples of female soldiers? Okay. Um, Obviously, we get the women who disguise themselves as men to fight. So Mm -hmm. that is very much a... um, It's a... It's a surprisingly common occurrence, not so much in a statistical sense, but just in the range of time. We start seeing regular stories of it from early modern Europe. And the last stories really appear with World War I, and there aren't very many of those. Once you get to that point in the war, um, or in World War I, where you start to have medical examinations of soldiers, it just becomes harder to do. So you've got that, where those women are soldiers. But there are also places where women end up being soldiers. The West African Kingdom of Dahomey had all female units, um, in, from the 17th through the 19th century, they were full-time, professional, trained soldiers. They fought in all female ranks with all female commanders, um, but they certainly count as soldiers by any standard. And the Europeans who come up against them pretty are uniformly pretty impressed with their abilities. The other places that we tend to see um, women who are actually soldiers tend to be later. And the most dramatic examples of those come in Russia, both in the World, World War I and World War II. In World War I, you, after the provisional government takes over, after the February Revolution, you get this sense of women are citizens and should now have all the rights as citizens. So women already start saying we should be allowed to join the military. At the same time, Russia had been getting such a beating in the war that there was a um, a growing movement urging the creation of all-female units. You get the formation of first a single battalion, the Women's Battalion of Death, which had about 300 women. We know they actually went into battle, and they did pretty well. And then after their success, the provisional government um, formed about 15 all-female regiments, and then there were some volunteer regiments that got 
created by individual groups as opposed to the government. At the same time, it's less clear how many of those actually went to battle. We do know the Women's Battalion of Death went into battle. Then in World War II, obviously, Russia has the, the Night Witches, the, the famous units of female fighter and bomber pilots. Um, and you also just get women who are in the Red Army. They're particularly known as snipers. There seems to be a, a consensus that women make good snipers. That, they're, that, that may be one of the places where physical differences actually works in, on behalf of women. So we don't get a lot of them. An awful lot of them are in Russia, and they tend to be, before the modern world, um, still 20th century. Well, this is interesting because you said that we see it appear repeatedly throughout time of women disguising themselves to fight. So a global historical question that we can look at across cultures. Um, did you see any common reasons that women would disguise themselves to fight? Yes. They aren't necessarily the ones you expect. They're part of a broader category of women who live as men for a number of reasons. One very compelling reason is financial. In the early modern period and later, certainly the large European standing armies, the very poor often joined because it was a uniform, it was food, it was a job you ate. And so there were women from the poorer ranks who also joined the army for the same reason. The largest group we know of are the women who fought in the American Civil War. It's estimated 400 to 600 women that have been identified. Um, it's clear that a number of them fight for reasons of patriotism, reasons of commitment to the cause. But the handful of personal accounts by those women also suggest that not only were they going toward something, but they were also leaving something. Um, so even in that case, it's not a clear case of patriotism, believing in the war. But there, there are these underlying social issues that make it more, um, there are a lot of advantages to being a man through much of history. Yeah. Yeah. So just like some women lived as men so they could get a job, get an education, and admittedly some some also because there was a woman they wanted to be with romantically, but we don't really know for the most part about lesbian, not lesbian, transgender, not transgender. What we do know is a job, an education, a meal on the table. Right. The vast expanse of history is scarcity and poverty. We like to imagine that everyone does things for ideological reasons all the time. A lot of times it's, you know, I don't want to starve. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, yeah. Hey, everyone. Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. And here's a question, too. Now, we know these stories because it was revealed at some point that they were, in fact, women. If they had never been found out or had never revealed it, then we wouldn't know that women have fought. So what happens when they're found out for those who are assuming a male identity? Do they announce after the fact? Are they, are they found while they're serving as soldiers? And, and what happens when they're found out? Well, some of them are found as when they're serving as soldiers. Often the reason we know about it is because the disguise failed. The most common way is they got wounded. And, you know, if you got shot in the hand, you can probably still sustain your disguise. If you get shot in the gut, you're not going to sustain that disguise. We get accounts in the Civil War of women whose disguise fails the one that I remember most clearly is someone tossed an apple to a woman and she spread her legs to catch it in her skirt, which obviously wasn't there. Mm. And they kind of looked at her and said, what? <laughs> so, so you find, so women's disguise fails, whether it's because of, they give themselves away in some form or, um, or they're wounded, which is the most common one. Sometimes they're discovered after they're dead. The earliest example I know of, of women who disguise themselves as men, 
is in a 12th century Byzantine account of uh, 3rd century Persia, where after a battle, people go into the field to bury the dead and care for the wounded and find that a number of the Persian soldiers are in fact women, dressed as men. Um, there's a small category of um, women who are whose disguise fails because children recognize them. Evidently, you know, for a lot of history, if you're wearing pants, it just triggers to the mind that it's a man. Um, so that in, in the 18th and 19th century, the easiest disguise was just to put on men's clothing and claimed to be a teenage boy to explain why you don't shave. That apparently worked with adults really well, but children were not necessarily <laughs> fooled. Interesting. A pair of pants. So that was an odd one. But once they're found, several, and a few people in early modern Europe get found because they commit some other crime while they're disguised and then end up on trial and it comes out. Once they're found, it can go a couple of ways. The most common is they are told to leave. <laughs> period. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them come back and re-enlist under another name in another, another place and go through it several times. Um, by and large, they don't get punished in any way. They're just thrown out. In a few cases where someone has done so well, they are allowed to stay. And that's usually with a really specific... Um, it usually comes from someone relatively high in the ranks who lets them stay. Um, and there are two examples of this that come to mind immediately. One of them, again, Russian, a woman named, last name's Durova. Um, the other thing about doing a global history is you end up with a lot of people whose names you can't. <laughs> yes. She enlists as a man in 1806. She met in the Russian army fighting against Napoleon. And as she goes, she made the mistake of leaving her father a letter telling her what she was doing. Her hope was, in fact, that he would be proud of her because he was himself a cavalry officer. He was not proud of her. He was very <laughs> upset. He sent a letter to the czar asking the czar to find his daughter and send her home. So you've got this brief period where Russia and where the czar and Napoleon have signed a peace treaty. And so after that, the czar has a few free moments and he sends the word down for this young soldier to come to court and he directly asks her are you a woman and she says yes and he actually gives her the cross of saint george which is the highest award that an enlisted man in the russian army could get for bravery and then he's getting ready to send her home and in her memoir she throws herself on the ground at his feet and begs not to be sent home to be allowed to stay so he allows her to stay in the army he gives her a name that reflects back to his own name so that in some ways he's taking over the role of father for her and she can stay with the caveat that she continue to be in disguise, that she not tell anyone who she is. So that's one version. The other one that's really fascinating, I think, is a woman called Malonka Savic, who's Serbian. She enlisted in the First Balkan War, was first discovered in the Second Balkan War, again, because she was wounded. And she had already, prior to that time, received awards for valor. She had been promoted to a non-commissioned officer. And her officer just said, you know, you're, you're very good at this, but you're a woman, and we'd love to just transfer you to the nursing corps. And she basically said, I don't want to do anything where I'm not carrying a gun for my country. And he said, okay, well, why don't you wait until... Uh, while I think about this, and she said, I'll just stay right here. Several hours later, she was still standing right there, presumably at attention, and he basically said, okay, I guess you're staying. Um, and she actually got promoted at that point. She fought all the way through World War One. Ultimately, the Serbian forces ended up 
under command of the French, where, and at each new step, each new officer, she kind of had to negotiate this, I'm a woman and I'm staying thing, but she 